It's time for Herd Mentality, the weekly episode where you control the discussion today on Locked On Bills. You are Locked On Bills, your daily Buffalo Bills podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Bills Mafia? It's Joe Marino, author of Go Bills and Buffalo's Run, also the co-host of the Locked On NFL Scouting Podcast, and I'm your host of Locked On Bills. want to thank you for making Locked On Bills your first listen every day, and a big welcome and shout-out to our everydayers. You know who you are. Those of you who never miss a single episode, I appreciate y'all being here very, very much. I'd also like to invite you to subscribe or follow for free on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts, we're part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. This episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. Visit betterhelp.com slash locked on today to get 10% off your first month. Well, folks, tons, and I mean tons of great herd mentality items for us to dig into. A lot of the hot button discussion points around the Buffalo Bills were encapsulated with the herd mentality question. So let's dive into it. First one here comes from Drew. Drew says, when we lost Tremaine Edmonds, the team suggested a change in philosophy. They talked about how Edmonds couldn't be asked to cover a slot receiver and how they wanted to play with two matchup linebackers. First off, what is a matchup linebacker? And what is the difference compared to a traditional middle linebacker? From what you've seen this preseason, does it seem like the Bills are playing with two matchup linebackers? Do the current middle linebacker contenders play with a matchup style or with a more traditional style? In other words, compared to the defense with Edmonds, is the defense now going to be different or worse with this year's candidates? Really good question here. And so let me try to dive into all of the specifics here and hopefully paint a good picture for you. So what is a matchup linebacker? And how is that different than a traditional middle linebacker? The best thing that I can tell you is that Matt Milano is a matchup linebacker, and he's one of the best in all of football. And what he's asked to do is play outside, weak side usually, and play in space. He will match up man-to-man with tight ends and slot receivers from time to time. He will serve as more of a pursuit-style player, and so he's a backside player and he's able to just flow and chase plays, kind of more of a see ball, get ball situation, as opposed to if you're a traditional middle linebacker, you know, you're reading keys, you're playing downhill, uh, your coverage responsibilities are much more limited, and you're not really tasked with carrying routes vertically down the field or getting a ton of depth and being responsible for a ton of real estate with your zone coverage drops. And so there's just very different, responsibilities when it comes to a traditional linebacker, a traditional Mike linebacker versus a matchup linebacker. And I mean, look at what the Bills had before with Edmonds and Milano. Edmonds was your more traditional uh, middle linebacker and Matt Milano was or in is a, a very traditional modern day matchup linebacker. So that's how they're different. So your next question was, do current middle linebacker contenders play matchup style or traditional? Well, I think you have some of each. In terms of matchup-style linebackers, Terrell Bernard and Dorian Williams kind of fit that profile as of matchup-type linebackers. Uh, Traditional linebackers, Tyrell Dotson and A.J. Klein are more that type of player. And then I would say Balen Specter is kind of in between uh, both. And so hopefully that will continue to help paint the picture. Think about Bernard Williams, rangy, speedy, athletic guys. Uh, versus traditional guys, Dotson and Klein, bigger bodied, more burly downhill players that have some limitations when you really ask them to play in space. So how is the defense going to be different this year, kind of moving away from Tremaine Edmonds and into these current options? Well, I think first of all, you're going to see more middle of the field closed coverages. And what I mean by that is less too high safety shells. Uh, So I think you're going to have a middle-of-the-field defender, and what that's going to do is really not ask the middle linebacker to get as much depth 
with their coverage drops and not being as responsible for that deep middle where you're now going to have a safety in that spot uh, to reduce the amount of real estate that the player is responsible for in coverage. And so I, I understand everything that the Bills are trying to do with these two matchup linebackers. I think you can look across the league and see that and it's happening some across the board. Um, but the reality is right now your your candidates are Dotson, Klein, and Bernard. And two of those three are not matchup linebackers. So for as much as they say they want to have this style of player, and you can even look at their recent draft picks, their two recent third-round picks in, in Williams and Bernard, and you could say, yeah, those are more matchup style linebackers. But you really aren't positioning yourself right now because of the Bernard injury to have two matchup linebackers. So it's cool that they said that, and I, I could certainly buy into the philosophy. But if Bernard doesn't win the job and it's either Dotson or Klein, you you now have a traditional linebacker that has significant coverage questions, right? I don't think Tremaine Evans was the best downhill player. I think he was probably average in that capacity, but he was very good in zone coverage. Now you have lesser players, perhaps downhill and way lesser players for coverage. So all the things that they preach to us about the restrictions that Tremaine Edmonds has, they are elevated to another degree if you're leaning into Tyrell Dotson or A.J. Klein in that role. So hopefully that didn't make things more confusing and it painted a good picture, but what's challenging is aligning what's happening with that messaging and really seeing um, good cohesion and good congruency between what's actually happening and what the messaging was. The next one here comes from Craig, and it's a little bit along the same lines, and I got some other questions that were very similar to this. Craig says, I'd love an in-depth review of a base dime defense. I appreciated your earlier discussion on the topic, but with the deficiencies at middle linebacker, this seems even more relevant. Specifically, how would Taylor Rapp's role and responsibilities as a dime safety slash linebacker differ him from a traditional middle linebacker? What does the defense gain and lose comparatively? I know base nickel is conceptually weak against the run. Dime would presumably be even worse. But is that the leading edge of an NFL defensive development? It seems like so much of the cat and mouse game in today's NFL is about the offense putting the defense in unresolvable conflict, and that seems most pronounced at middle linebacker. In what scenarios does Tyrell Dodson better respond to those conflicts than a safety, than a dime safety. Really good question here from Craig, and hopefully I can provide some good clarity uh, with this. But for those of you that maybe have no idea what a dime defense is, you're basically looking at four defensive linemen, one linebacker, and six defensive backs. And your six defensive backs is traditionally three safeties. And so that's where you would see Taylor Rapp come into the game and then whoever the Mike linebacker is, go out of the game. So it'd be Matt Milano with your normal safeties and corners, plus Taylor Rapp is the guy next to him as the dime linebacker, but he's actually a safety. And so that's where Taylor Rapp would fit into that equation. And what it benefits for you as a defense is that you can really space the field differently in zone. You can um, be very creative with your with your spacing and knowing that you have a lot of range and athleticism on the field, you can even man it up in some spots and play with some some zones over top, right? There's some very good coverage, I mean, really good coverage advantages. And when you, you made a great point there about the cat and mouse game of today's NFL being about putting defenses in unresolvable conflict and that being most pronounced at middle linebacker, you're absolutely right. They're going to see what the middle linebacker does a lot of times and – counter off of it, right? They read the middle linebacker. It could be an RPO. It could be um, read option. It could be even, you know, some of the play action stuff. Everything is about putting that middle linebacker in conflict, whether it's that it's flooding zones, right? With, with bunch of guys in routes and just putting them in conflict. And no matter what they do, they're wrong. It's, it's a very, very tough situation. It's hard to play middle linebacker in today's NFL. And when you have a, a, a safety in that spot, you're just gaining more athleticism. And so what you're relying on from that player is they're put in conflict and they're going to be wrong no matter what. 
but do they have the reactive athleticism to respond, right? Hey, you moved me out of position. I was wrong. There was no way I could be right. But what type of athleticism, re, you know, reactive athleticism do you have to put yourself back into position to potentially make a play? And obviously with a more athletic safety coming in for that linebacker, you can help um, resolve some of those conflicts after you're already kind of in that pickle that they're going to put you in. So there's a lot of advantages here. As far as responsibilities, they're the same. Taylor Rapp's responsibilities would be the same as the middle linebacker. You're just doing it with a smaller uh, but more athletic player. Now, you're obviously more susceptible against the run. Um, and so, you know, that's the thing with the base nickel defense is that you only have two linebackers. And so you're swapping out a traditional strong side linebacker for uh, a nickel corner, right? So think about swapping out Lorenzo Alexander for Taron Johnson. That's your practical application to that. You know, you're, you have a smaller player there. Now you're quicker, you're more athletic, but you don't have that ability to really take on contact and be physical and play downhill quite as well. But what you lose in that size and physicality, you make up for in athleticism. But it is something that you can only really use situationally. I mean that a dime defense is, is really only a situational call for long and late downs, obvious passing situations. And so that's where it becomes advantageous to run that. So I think Dotson is going to give you more on traditional rundowns and less on every passing down. Hopefully that was a good answer and it helped uh, help gain more understanding of, of some of the advantages of a dime defense and, and then, of course, some of the disadvantages as well. Next one here comes from Justin. Justin says, when do the Bills take a look at their roster and realize that they're an aging group? Not really old, but start to find some new cornerstone youth. I don't think this is a right now issue, but it's closer than we think. I've heard some comments out there about the Bills and their roster being older. So let's talk about it, and this is a good way to do it with this question from Justin. Right now, the Bills do have the uh, the third oldest roster in the NFL. The average age of the players on the roster is 26.79 years old. What I'd like to remind people of whenever we talk about the age of a roster is that the range is very, very small. Okay, The Bills' average age, 26.79. The youngest roster in the NFL 25.02. It's not that big. I mean, they are very close to being the youngest roster in the league. You take off one guy who's 32 on your roster and put one guy that's 23, all of a sudden you go from like the third oldest roster to the, the middle of the pack. You know what I mean? That, that, that's how slim the margins are. So I don't, this is not a statistic that I really fall in love with or put much stock into. So your, your youngest roster is 25.02. Your oldest is 26.93. That range is so small. And as far as you know, young cornerstone players, I think you can look at the Bills and you would say, okay, your cornerstones are Josh Allen, uh, Deion Dawkins, Steph Diggs, uh, Von Miller, Matt Milano, Trey White, Micah Hyde, Jordan Poyer. There's certainly some veterans, right? Some aging players in there that may only have two, three seasons left. But there's still some players that are moderately young within that group, like a Josh Allen, right, for for example, like a Matt Milano, like a Deion Dawkins, where I don't, I think they're in their prime and not even close to being out of it. Now, you do have some young building blocks. You've got Dalton Kincaid and Osiris Torrance and James Cook and Dawson Knox, Ed Oliver, Greg Rousseau. We'll see what happens with Gabe Davis. But, you know, there is this mix of, all right, guys that are established vets, cornerstones that are aging, but you have – some guys that are younger and are developing into cornerstones, and then you still have draft picks every year, right? That's where it becomes very necessary to hit on picks and um, replenish your nucleus and add more young cornerstones. And it looks like the Bills might have done that this past year with uh, the drafting of Dalton Kincaid and Osiris Torrance. You, you maybe look back to last year and say it's not looking that good for Kyer Elam. You know, so we'll see how that all pans out. We'll talk about Kyer Elam here in the next segment. But yeah, the Bills do have some old uh, or older cornerstones, but this this range is so small. Again, 25.02, that's the youngest roster. 26.93 is the oldest. You know, the margins are very slim and and really, you know, if the Bills didn't have Latavius Murray and instead had some you know, six round running back that they picked, I mean, they're probably middle of the pack. I mean, that's how that's how small the margins are when it comes to NFL roster age. But again, the, the onus is back on Brandon Bean. As always, I've said this for years now, he's got to hit on draft picks. That's how you're going to maintain 
uh, this competitive deep roster and um, continue to replenish uh, inevitably as you have to lose players because they become more expensive. Today's episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. Getting to know yourself can be a lifelong process, especially because we're always growing and changing. Therapy is all about deepening your self-awareness and understanding because sometimes we don't know what we want or why we react the way that we do until we talk things through. BetterHelp connects you with a licensed therapist who can take you on that journey of self-discovery from wherever you are. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. All you do is fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist, and then you can even switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Discover your potential with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash LockedOn today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash LockedOn. Welcome back. I told you we'd talk about Kyer Elam. We're going to through this question that comes courtesy of Don. Don says, in listening this week, I have uh, to ask this question about Kyer Elam. Correct me if I'm wrong, but coming out of college, he was mainly a press man corner. Good at being sticky and locking up his man. So when we take him to be mainly a zone corner, I figured this would be an easy transition. A sticky lockdown corner just has to cover a zone now. Piece of cake. I say that jokingly. Obviously, this transition has been hard for him. Do you think that's the issue? Trying to force a square peg, press man corner, into a round hole, zone corner. It's a fair question, Don. Let me give you some of my thoughts on this. Um, first of all, yes, you're exactly right. Kyrie Elam, press man corner in college, coming to the Bills and being asked to play a lot more zone coverage. Now, you can look at that and say, yeah, well, you didn't pick the right player or the right skill set for what you like to do defensively. But I would counter that and say, well, having more skill set variety is a good thing and it opens up more schematic variety. Perhaps the reason the Bills haven't run as much man coverage is because they haven't had corners that can play man coverage, right? And so you introduce this skill set to your arsenal and now all of a sudden if you want to run more man coverage, you have a player that can do that. So Yes, the Bills traditionally have run more zone defenses, but introducing that skill set could lead to some evolution and more options and how you play, you know, how you match up and align with with other other teams. So there's that piece of it. Then there's always this other dynamic of corner play in general. You know, we talk about zone corners, we talk about man corners, but every zone eventually becomes man. And so you could talk to anybody who scouts football players; they will always tell you that. The man coverage ability is the most important ability because every zone becomes man at some point. And it, it's teachable, right? You can teach somebody zone coverage, how to space the field, what landmarks are, when to close on routes, when to pass them off, all that type of stuff that's teachable. But man coverage is much harder, right? You need guys with the requisite foot speed and fluid hips and that ability to mirror and match uh, patterns, right? It's a harder thing to do. And some of it is you, you either have the foot speed the quickness, the reactive athleticism, the fluidity, the processing ability to read routes and stay in phase, or you don't, right? Asking a guy certain corners where Sewell Douglas or a Levi Wallace or a Josh Norman to play man coverage is going to be a disaster. But taking a guy that can play man coverage and putting him in zone, you feel like you can teach that, and then they have this dynamic athletic profile that can make them really, really effective. And so... I think that's all the, the important things to be mindful of when we consider, well, did the Bills take a square peg and, and force them into a round hole? Well, I guess, but maybe they wanted to have more versatility with how they play defense and run more man coverage, and they needed the skill set. And then there is that that mindset that, hey, every zone eventually becomes man. We can teach that. We can't teach guys how to play man coverage if they just don't have the, the physical traits to do it. And so... I can understand the intent of the draft pick. So far, it's not really working out, right? But as Sean McDermott says, and as I've brought up myself, Kyer Elam's a young player. I know that he's entering his second year as a first-round pick, but he's he's 22. I mean, he's a year and a half younger than Dalton Kincaid and Osiris Torrance. And so maybe it doesn't come together this year, but he's still got two more years on his rookie deal plus the fifth-year option. There could be three years here. And so it's not happening as fast as anybody wants it to, but I don't think that this is a situation where you start dropping the bust label, 
on, on Kyer Elam. There's more time for this to play out. Next one here comes from Don. Don says, is it safe to say wide receiver six is down to Andy Isabella, Justin Shorter, and a long shot being Tyrell Shavers? If you're asking me, Isabella should be the leader right now, and if we're just evaluating play on the field and in training camp, Shorter is the height, weight, speed athlete with the good special teams profile. Shavers has shown shortcomings, but he's also shown some juice at wide receiver. If I'm not mistaken, he was an elite gunner on, on punt team in college. You're exactly right. If it's indeed Isabella, what are the chances we can get Shorter back on the practice squad? High, medium, low risk of being claimed? Same question for Shavers. So I think this is a good question, and I think that this wide receiver six discussion, assuming the first five are Steph Diggs, Gabe Davis, uh, Deontay Hardy, Trent Shurfield, and Khalil Shakir, that's your first five. You're going to roster six. The Bills have never rostered seven. I don't think that changes this year. And so I think it's more of a Justin Shorter versus in Andy Isabella con conversation. And Tyler Tyrell Shavers, I think, is a really good candidate to get back on the practice squad. And I think the Bills have zero challenges getting him back on the practice squad. I think you got a really good chance, uh, not, a, not as good of a chance, but you still have a good chance of getting Justin Shorter back on the practice squad. Uh, and maybe Isabella is a little bit less. I'm not sure. I mean, it, the NFL has not been super interested in Andy Isabella. He, you know, finished up in Arizona, was available all season long. He finally has a cup of coffee with the Baltimore Ravens on their practice squad. And then he signed late, right? Like right up against training camp this past offseason. So the NFL hasn't been super uh, interested, if you will, in signing Andy Isabella. So I think there's still a chance you could even cut him and get him back on the practice squad. Um, but as for Justin Shorter, I mean, the advantage is here. He does give you that height, weight, speed ability. He's on a rookie deal, cost control, fifth round pick. You've got him under control for four more seasons. Uh, he's got a lot of size, like we mentioned, really good hands. He's young, right? Um, and he's he works hard, right? I watched him a lot at practice. I mean, he's early on the field, working the jugs machine. You know, he's he's putting in the time. I think there's a lot to like about Justin Shorter. I, I don't know that his route running is ever going to be great. I think he's always going to be a guy that relies on size, ball skills, physicality to win. Um, and there's some limitations there. I don't think he's like a, a player that will do well in the slot. Doesn't really offer return ability, but on other special teams, covering kicks and punts, blocking for kicks and punts, I think he does have quite a bit of appeal. For Andy Isabella, I mean, I think you're getting a more dynamic player offensively with more versatility. He can play in the slot. I think he's going to be a better route runner. Uh, he's got some questions with his hands. There's always been some deficiencies there, but you know, I think he's a more dynamic athlete that offers more versatility on offense. Now, he's showing the return ability. He's showing that ability to serve as a gunner here recently. I think you got a real competition here between these two guys, and, and someone's going to be the wide receiver six, and someone's going to potentially be the guy that they're hoping to get back on the practice squad. And we'll have to see how this all plays out. But I think it is Isabella versus Shorter, and I could talk myself into either one, to be honest with you. Um, and then, you know, is there an X factor here? Is there a player we're not considering? Could they both make it? Is Deontay Hardy out, the odd man out? I know Khalil Shakir only had one snap with the Bills uh, starters with Josh Allen in the field in the last game. You know, I don't know. I, I don't feel like those first five are in question, but you can talk me into that as well. But I think the reality is you've got you got room for six receivers, and I think these two guys are probably competing for that last spot. Next one here comes from Chris. Chris says, with the roster cut down coming, can you explain how the practice squad works? Maybe the rules and how the waiver wire works. Thank you. Yeah, let's do it, Chris. There's a lot of information coming for you here. And this is all going to be very, very relevant over the next few weeks as the Bills have their last preseason game on Saturday. We have final cuts. There's practice squads to form. And being aware of all these details is going to help you process what's going on here. So let's talk about it the best that I can deliver it to you. So first, let's talk about cuts. All right. And players that are cut, uh, some of them are subject to waivers, okay? Any player with less than four years of NFL experience when cut is not a free agent, okay? So if you have four years of NFL experience when you're cut, you are not a free agent, or excuse me, less than four years. Less than four years of NFL experience, you are not a free agent. So if Justin Shorter gets cut, he is not a free agent. He becomes a player subject to waivers, okay? And I'll talk about what waivers are here in just a moment. If you have four years of NFL experience or more, then you become an immediate free agent. So if the Bills were to cut a player like 
Uh, let's call him AJ Klein. AJ Klein, a veteran, he is not subject to waivers. If he's cut, he's immediately a free agent and is able to set, sign with any team. Okay, again, if you have less than four years of NFL service when cut, then you are subject to waivers. And any player on waivers is subject to having their contract claimed by another NFL team. So let's talk about waivers. What are waivers? During the offseason and through the first three weeks of the regular season, the waiver priority is the same as the recent year's draft order. And then after the third week of the regular season, the waiver priority reverts to reflect the current NFL standings in reverse order. So the team with the worst record gets first priority on all waiver claims. The team with the next worst record is second. The third worst record is third, so on and so forth. But for now, it's still the draft order. So what the Bills' original pick was, what, 27th last year, something like that? That's what order they have. So if the Bills want to claim a player, the 26 teams in front of them have to say no for the Bills to be awarded that player. The team that has the number one pick, which was the Bears, right? They earned the number one pick. I know they traded it. They have the first opportunity to claim any player that's subject to waivers. All right, so that's cuts. And that's waivers. All right. Now, if they clear waivers, then they can be signed to the practice squad. And there's rules for the practice squad. You can have 16 players on your practice squad, and you can add any of those 16 players, any number of players who have not accrued at least nine games in an NFL season. So young players that have not accrued at least nine games in an NFL season, you can have 16 of those. You can also have up to four players of the 16 who have accrued no more than two NFL seasons. All right? And then you can have up to six players with no limitations on experience. So a guy like A.J. Klein, Dean Marlowe, Matt Barkley, those guys who have been in the NFL for a number of years, you could put them on your practice squad, um, but you can only have six of those. So you can have as many up to 16 that have not accrued at least nine NFL nine games. You can have up to four who have accrued no more than two seasons and up to six with no limitations on experience. So the next question is, what is an accrued season? An accrued season is earned by being on a team's active roster, the reserve injured or physically unable to perform list for six or more regular season games. So once you are either on the active roster on IR or the pup list for six regular season games, you have earned an accrued season. And that's important for pension and all kinds of stuff. So that's, that's a lot of information, but I want to get into this because we get, we're getting to the point where, and I've already started to see some of the questions. All right. What is the likelihood that the bills can get this player back on the practice squad? Right. And we're talking about some guys, some draft picks here, potentially Justin shorter, Alex Austin, Nick broker, Players the Bills are probably going to cut, and you're going to be nervous that another team is going to sign them. Well, 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 there's some reality here. And courtesy of my buddy Greg Tobset from Cover One, he's done the research here. And the Bills, since 2017, uh, up against the cut deadline, have released 222 players. Of those, 13 have been claimed, which is 5.8%. In 20, 2018, uh, players that the Bills cut and were claimed by other teams to their active roster, Ike Bucker, Adam Redmond, Kalen Clay, Tanner Vallejo. In 2019, Ray Ray McLeod, Ryan Lewis, and Dion Lacey. 2020, Vincent Taylor. 2021, Nick McLeod. And then 2022, Nick McLeod again, Luke Tenuta, Tanner Owen, and Kingsley Jonathan. So that's the reality of what's happened. I remember last year, everyone was nervous about Raheem Blackshear, right? And um, Isaiah Hodgins, right? The Bills are able to get both of those guys back on their practice squad. And so we, we're always going to have a level of concern about not being able to get some of these players back that you want. Um, but in, in all reality, only 13 out of 222 players the Bills have released since 2017 have actually um, been claimed by other teams. So a lot of information there. Hopefully you processed it because it's going to be very relevant here over the next uh, you know week or so. Football season is about to kick off, and FanDuel is giving you the chance to win all season long because right now when you bet on a Super Bowl winner, you can get bonus bets every time they win in the regular season. Just pick any team to win the Super Bowl, and you'll get bonus bets for every victory. So if you want to go on there and pick the Bills to win the Super Bowl, when they win during the regular season, you will get bonus bets, and you can use your bonus bets on spreads, player props, over unders and more. So visit fanduel.com slash locked on and start earning bonus bets with America's number one sports book. 
That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. All right, we got some more to get to here today. The next one comes from James. James says, if you had to pick a position on offense or defense to have a below replacement level starter, what would it be? For me, middle linebacker has to be a top five answer. Um, so if I were to have a below uh, replacement level starter at a position, this would be the order of positions that I would choose. Running back, go ahead and give me the below replacement level starter. I think it's the least important position uh, in football. Uh, production's easy to find, and I never get concerned about running backs. Uh, guard, you know, I think if you had to get by uh, with a with a below average starter, uh, guard is is probably a spot to do that. Tight end is probably another one. Uh, middle linebacker and safety. I think those are your positions of lowest value. If you had to get by with a player, uh, that that would be the order of of the positions: running back, guard, tight end, middle linebacker, and safety. The next one here comes from Andrew. Andrew says, "Can you explain leverage?" I hear you mention this a lot. For example, on today's podcast, you said Elam didn't play with correct leverage and then said something about Kincaid using good leverage. All right, we can probably do an entire podcast on this, but I'm going to try to make this a, a bite-sized answer. Um, so leverage in, in football can mean different things based on what specific aspect of the game you are discussing. Like you mentioned, I used it to discuss Dalton Kincaid. I used it to, to discuss Kyer Elam. But I think generally, leverage can be summed up by a very simple definition, and then I'll get into some of the practical application. My very simple definition of leverage is the physical advantage given by position. Not position meaning wide receiver, tight end. By I mean position by your alignment on the field. The physical advantage given by position, okay? the leverage that you play with. You want to play with good leverage. I don't just mean low pads, right? That's not what I mean by leverage. It's about where you are in relationship to your opponent and your assignment. All right, so for example, let's talk about the 62-yard touchdown run from Jalen Warren against the Bills in the preseason. You had two leverage problems with the Bills' defense that led to that. Number one, Puna Ford got reach blocked, and so that means that the offensive lineman was able to put his body between the ball carrier and Puna Ford. And because Puna Ford was out leveraged to the football because that blocker was in between them, because he got reach blocked, you had a leverage issue. Okay, so that's your leverage problem number one. Then you had another leverage problem on that play where Tyrell Dotson, when he took on the block from Isaac Ciamalu, he was not able to scrape over top. So once again, Tyrell Dotson got pinned inside, lost his leverage, and that offensive lineman, Isaac Ciamalu, was able to seal him to spring Jalen Warren. And so the Bills had two leverage problems on that run that led to them getting gashed. Puna Ford got out leveraged. Tyrell Dotson got out leveraged. And so there's some good practical application. You could look at, like I mentioned with blocks, you want to create leverage. You want to get yourself between the football where you know the ball carrier and your man that you're blocking, that's going to give you good leverage. For a wide receiver, when they're running routes, it's all about creating leverage. If I'm trying to run a route and I have to run an in-breaking pattern and I have a cornerback stacked on top of me, I want to run my route stem in such a way that's going to allow me to get that leverage, to get that inside leverage, right? I said it's an in-breaking pattern. So I got to find a way to get myself on the inside of that corner. So how are you going to run your route stem to manipulate that corner to get inside and establish that leverage advantage that you're looking for? When you're a quarterback, you want to throw to leverage, right? I want to throw the football if I'm a quarterback to a spot where my receiver has a leverage advantage over the coverage, right? Throw to that window where you have a leverage advantage. For cornerbacks, you want to maintain leverage, right? So the Kyer Elam play that I'm talking about was against Calvin Austin. And Calvin Austin beat Kyer Elam inside. He didn't help have help inside. So he had the sideline was his help. And then inside, he didn't have any help. And so what Kyer Elam needed to do is play with better leverage to funnel that throw more towards the sideline or funnel that route more towards the sideline where he had help. The sideline was his, was his help, where he didn't have any inside help. And so giving up inside leverage was a foolish thing to do uh, because that created a very easy throwing 
opportunity for Pittsburgh because of the leverage that he created. So football in so many ways is just about how do you create leverage? How do you attack leverage? And how do you take advantage of leverage? And it can kill you and it can help you just depending on the assignment. But generally, it's the physical advantage given by position. Hopefully that made sense. Would love to, if you have any more questions, hit me up. We'll, we'll talk more about it. Uh, next one here comes from Dan. Dan says, do you really think Josh Allen will try to take fewer hits this year? Do you think he would perform worse with a leash, if that makes sense? Our guy craves contact. One would argue that he even plays better after contact. We've all seen it. He loves it, and I love that about him. I get that we want him to last longer than a running back. Lord knows he's getting paid more than one, but the hits that worry me are the most unanticipated ones that he takes in the pocket. The point is, why take away a player's strength and try to govern what gets him pumped up? In my opinion, telling Josh to avoid contact would be like Peyton Manning to call fewer audibles. Good luck. I say jo let Josh be Josh and continue to invest in the O-line to protect him. Hopefully he moves in. Uh, hopefully the moves in the offseason will do just that. Yeah, Dan, I, I see this very similarly to you. I want Josh Allen to always do the things that make him special, right? And part of what makes him special is how competitive he is, uh, how he's able to weaponize his legs, how physical he is, right? That's what makes him a, a dynamic football player, one of the best football players in the entire NFL. Now, can Josh Allen pick some of his spots better? Yeah, absolutely. And I think those are the hits that bother me, right? I agree with you that, that I'm most concerned, all right? I'm always most concerned about hits in the pocket. Right, those that's how quarterbacks get hurt. Hits in the pocket. But where I, I get bothered by Josh Allen and taking hits are when he can pick his spots better. Brother, you're up by three scores in the second half against the Rams on opening night. Probably not the time to lower your shoulder into a linebacker, right? You know, I think there's some opportunities where he needs to be smarter about when he picks his spots to be physical. So that's where I think he can really grow. And obviously, Josh has discussed it. We hear it every offseason from Bean and McDermott. It's something that they're talking about, but you can't coach that. And I don't want to coach that out of Josh Allen. I just want him to be more selective. And yes, the, the, the hits that concern me the most are the ones in the pocket. Now, some of that's on Josh too, right? Some of that is on Josh Allen. The way that he plays football uh, can put a lot of stress on your pass protection. He's running all over the place. He is, uh, his launch points are everywhere. He forces you to, to block for longer, right? So I think we're always going to be a little bit frustrated with, the pass protection for Josh Allen. And some of that's just because of Josh Allen, the style of football he plays. His launch panel points are all over the place. And he's also a guy that makes them protect for longer. And so we, I think we just need to be mindful of that as we navigate this Josh Allen career and have our own thoughts about hits and preserving him and all that type of stuff. Some of it's his fault too. So be mindful of that, even when it comes in the pocket. Now, if he's continuously facing quick pressure, yeah, then you have a problem. But Josh is always going to be these this guy that is going to run around, make people miss, and extend plays and win off script. That's a big part of what makes him special. And so we kind of have to take it all in stride and be mindful of the entire picture here as we think about Josh Allen and the hits that he takes. Now, obviously, my another concern that I have with Josh Allen that I've articulated a ton through the years is just his process, right, in terms of off the field, getting ready for games, getting ready for a season, right? If he's going to have the longevity that we all want him to have, I think him coming up with the right regiment to um, recover from a season, to prepare for a season, developing pliability, strengthening himself in areas that are going to be critical, that's the stuff that I'm really looking for from Josh uh, to elongate his career. So some of my general thoughts on Josh Allen taking hits, et cetera, et cetera. All right, folks, looking forward to tomorrow here on the podcast. It's going to be my all 22 review of the Bills versus Steelers. I'm going to spend a lot of time watching the offensive line in pass protection, going to comment on Spencer Brown, Osiris Torrance, Dalton Kincaid, the rookie class, the, the linebackers, all the big storylines. I'm going to check the tape and have plenty of opinions for you tomorrow on the podcast. So don't miss it. Make sure that you're subscribed. Would love it if you took a second to rate, review, and share the podcast. Have a great rest of your day. Go Bills. And I look forward to catching up with you again tomorrow.